Much like their mythical namesakes, vampire bats must feast on fresh blood every two to three days or die of starvation. They seek out warm-blooded mammals, thriving off domestic livestock living in the tropical regions of South and Central America. Most victims never feel a thing, and the bite itself is superficial. But increasingly, bats are targeting humans, and the encounters are turning deadly. The bats are blamed for rabies outbreaks in Peru, and National Geographic grantee Daniel Stryker is researching the environmental causes and extent of the disease. The vampire bats are kind of the, the perfect storm of, of different ecological characteristics. On the one hand, these bats are feeding on larger mammals, which are susceptible to rabies. And in order to feed on these animals to drink their blood, they have to bite. And biting is also the main route of transmission of rabies virus. Stryker is surveying vampire bats from the Amazon rainforest to the farms along the valleys of the Andes Mountains. Vampire bats are native to Peru, but 500 years ago, settlers imported an ideal food source, cattle. And as the number of livestock increases and spreads across the country, so too does the population of vampire bats. Today, large colonies thrive near areas devoted to ranching. Yet despite the burgeoning bat population, it's rare for people living in these agricultural areas to become infected with rabies. Rabies is a frightening and deadly disease. The classic form of the disease turns even docile creatures into aggressors that foam at the mouth. But the strain found in vampire bats is different. It's known as paralytic or dumb rabies, causing disorientation, muscle weakness, and eventually death. To learn more, he must turn the tables. This time it's a human taking blood from a vampire. Working at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC in Atlanta, Stryker adds a lab strain of the rabies virus to blood samples he collected from vampire bats in Peru. After an incubation period, the test results will show which bats had been exposed to the rabies. Under the microscope, Fluorescent green dye indicates no antibodies present, meaning the bat was free of disease. But if the results come back clear, the bat has antibodies. And Stryker knows the bat was exposed to rabies in the recent past. And so this is an important test for us because it allows us to, to first determine whether the virus is present or absent in a bat population. And finally, we can ask some questions at the population level, specifically asking things like, as you have more livestock in a given area, do you see a higher proportion of bats that have been exposed to this virus? Preliminary results indicate that vampire bats from agricultural areas may actually have a higher rate of infection than do bats from other parts of the country. So. Why then do so few people who live near cattle ranches fall ill with rabies? If there are so many bats around infected with the disease? Stryker believes that the livestock act as a buffer. Bats prefer passive herds to people, reducing the attacks on people. But as vampire bat populations increase and more livestock become infected, this could pose a greater rabies threat to people in the future. The same theory may explain why human rabies is more common in Peru's Amazon rainforest. Here, development such as logging, mining, and road construction has wiped out vast tracts of habitat and reduced wildlife populations. And since there's not much livestock in this area, the bats turn to another food source, humans. There may be fewer infected bats, but they bite people more frequently. Could this be why the disease is far more common here than in the Andes? There's much more to learn about how widespread rabies is among the country's bat population. What we don't know is how this disease is persisting in the vampire bats, and, we, and as a correlative of that, we don't know where it is in vampire bats. So again, much more widespread. Um, potentially, it's, it's always present in these bat populations. Stryker will continue to collect data, hoping his research will eventually help predict where people will need to be vaccinated. The more he learns about this frightening disease, 
the better the chance we may someday be able to control it.